Welcome everybody to an awesome session. I'm Elaine Zelby, partner at Signal Fire, one of the co-hosts of the event today. And I have two awesome guests with me. I have Elizabeth Wheel and Ellen Levy. So I thought we could kick it off by having you both just give a little background about yourselves. Maybe uh, Ellen, you wanna start? Yeah, sure. Um, great to be here. Uh, thanks for setting this up. Uh, let's see what's relevant. I have been in the Bay Area for about 30 years, and some might argue it looks like I couldn't make up my mind on what kind of job I want to do. I kind of like to think of I've done a sampling of the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Um, and so I have been at three startups over my time, uh, last couple of decades, the third of which was LinkedIn. So I got involved with LinkedIn at its founding and gradually gave more and more of my time until I went on the exec team and was the first head of Corp Devon strategy, taking the company through IPO. Um, but other roles, uh, and this will be relevant for how I have an investment strategy doing angel investing. Um, I went back to Stanford where I went to grad school. I returned about a decade later and ran a program at Stanford, connecting industry interests with all the tech related research going on in the university. Uh, right out of grad school, I worked out of the office of the CEO at Apple, um, and I have done full-time venture collectively a course of six years. So again, I pull on all of those things when I when I think about how I'm going about angel investing today. And as far as that's concerned, I've been full-time angel investor for about the last eight and a half years. I had dabbled in it before, but really it's been the last eight and a half years. I'm quick and dirty. I came out uh, to Stanford 21 years ago and was in economics undergrad, master's in engineering. After Stanford um, and throughout the end of it, uh, went to Menlo Ventures, a stage agnostic firm on Sand Hill. And after uh, about three years there really learning the venture game, I went to institutional venture partners and learned more the late stage venture game, evaluating companies that actually had metrics, things like that. We were fortunate at IVP to make a small investment in Twitter and uh, a quick dabble of how my husband factors into the story and part of my journey into it well. He'd done his undergrad on the East Coast, came out for his Stanford PhD, and he went over to start the analytics team at Twitter when it was about 30 people. I realized how much fun he was having there and uh, joined six months later to work for Dick Costello to start the Corp Dev, Biz Dev, Biz Ops, anything that was non-end and stayed through hyper growth up to 2,500 people, oh, just over four years, and then went to uh, Andreessen, and they were starting a team called Market Development, so essentially connecting the Fortune 500,000 to our portfolio companies, end goal being business development relationships, and really missed the, the motion of investing during that period, but loved building the team. And my husband and I had been fortunate to angel invest uh, for you know, six, seven, eight years at that point, and we were just putting checks into you know founders that we that had come out of Twitter, people we knew, and really enjoyed doing that. Um, I took one more step though as a managing director to 137 Ventures, a firm focused on structured secondaries, and had a fantastic uh, time there. The fourth managing director, and really got to wear a lot of hats. But what it made me learn was that. I loved working with our founders and our companies uh, in my C portfolio versus these transactions and the counterparties we were, were working with. And I just finally picked my head up and said, what do I love doing? What am I, am I armed best to do? And I really liked this motion. So I was joking uh, with some others that it took COVID for me to get out of my own way and take a leap because I think I was very nervous to launch, launch and turn into a more institutional fund. Um, so at the start of COVID, started putting together thoughts uh, to raise a small fund about $20 million and um, had had a, a crazy COVID period, but just closing our final close uh, a little bit north of 40. So feel very fortunate to um, be now uh, working Full time on Scribble Ventures, and it's a collection. Uh, me as as managing director, I hired a wonderful woman partner, Annalise Gamble, who had spent four years at Dropbox and then at uh, WTI after that. And Kevin Wheel, uh, husband, is our operator in residence, so he is not quitting his his day job, but um, is a third leg of our stool when it comes to 
the operator investor collab. So there's my there's my spiel. Now ask us anything. That's awesome. You know, both of you guys have tremendous operating experience as well as just a breadth and depth of investing experience. What are some of the lessons that you've learned on the investing side that you wish you would have learned earlier? Yeah, um, yeah, I can jump in with a couple. I, again, I'll answer with the the angel investor hat on, not any of the venture side. Um, but you know, some of the angel ones, I'll just kind of highlight a handful of things really quickly in almost like a list form of things. If I look back to when I first started doing full time angel investing about eight years ago, um, one that I learned right away is just because I see a friend or some colleague, former colleague's name on the list of investors, not to assume that there's been diligence done on the company. You know, I. Uh, I, I won't name the person, but there's a very well-known, highly regarded angel investor. And and I had seen that his name was on the cap table. And of course, as an angel, it's always great if you can, I, I think it's great if you can make decisions by proxy in terms of some of the stuff you have to get through that a, like a firm has the capacity to do that you don't. Due diligence, market maps, reference checking entrepreneurs. So I saw that this guy was an investor and I thought, that's awesome. I mean, I really like his track record. I like his investment theses. And so fast forward, it was about six months later and I, I was on a panel for a hackathon judging and, and he was there also judging. I said, I think we're co-invested in this deal. And he was like, and he's like, uh, what deal? He goes, oh yeah, no, I, I went to high school with that guy, right? So he had just thrown money at it. He didn't even remember the name of the company. So one is I do more calls than just saying, oh, that checks a box because I see reputable quality people involved. Um, because I used to take that as a, as a given. And then all of a sudden I ran into one or two. Another one, um, I stopped doing the really small checks. Uh, in the first five years of full-time investing, I started looking at which companies were dropping out soonest in terms of my portfolio and, and ones that were not successful. And it was pretty well correlated with the ones I was putting less money in, which I took to mean it was my, my subconscious hesitancy. Like, I don't know if I get this or I just want to be supportive. Um, and so I've, I've now just kind of tried to use that as partly a barometer of, do I actually believe in the company and the people? And then the third I'll throw out for now, there's some more we can get into if you want. Um, boy, no matter how many times people tell you to understand how much you believe in the idea and the entrepreneurs who are running it versus what you see in the company, um, until you do a couple of those, you're like, what a great idea, this is awesome. And, and then realize, but the entrepreneurs aren't seeing the big vision. They're seeing step one, or they may want to take it a different way. And what you're seeing, you're putting onto the company, but it doesn't exist in the company. Um, and so figuring out how much it's aligned and that the entrepreneur's vision is the one that's resonating with you um, is key. Because I've had probably a good five or six companies where I realized it wasn't a bad company, but the potential, the thing that says, you know, you look at a startup, especially in these pre-seed and seed stage, not only is the thing that they're working on right now, that first toe in the water, going to make it a good business. Like it's probably viable and worth something and it'll get bought, but that will be a stepping stone to the next level. And if they get that right, then all of a sudden, you know, five years from now, they could be the platform, right? Like those layers of potential. Um, you realize they're not seeing step two or step three. They probably can knock off step one and be acquired for, you know, it's something that's meaningful, but figuring out that it's you versus them helps also. Those are good lists. Uh, and one of the things that very early on I learned was a, really take this people first uh, model and something that I've applied on to what we're doing with, with Scribble. Uh, that you, similar to Ellen, you don't pivot what they have, but great founders can usually make something work ultimately. And when you're in this pre-seed seed round uh, and stage, there's so much you don't know, as all of you know. And great founders, great teams can really can really pivot to, to amazing things as well. Um, also, I really look to founders that can do great early hires. Uh, when you're hiring, and I think it shows your ability that other people are buying the idea that you're starting, but also to be able to continue this, this track record of hiring, recruiting, uh, and really fostering great talent internally to the company. And I think that's, that's such an important thing. Those are all great lessons. 
How do you guys think about the different stages of investing? You know, most I think most of your investments tend to be on the earlier stage, but how do you decide whether you'll go down to pre-seed or up to an A or series B? What does that look like in terms of a mental matrix and also how you would diligence those companies? Yeah, mine is not nearly as well thought out as a, as a formula or a set of processes. I like less expensive, so that one's pretty clear. Um, uh, so, so earlier stage, I also just like the challenges that are in front of the company, the earlier it is, right? So that you could be helping saying, hey, if they're trying to recruit some, some leadership to come to the company and leave really big other opportunities, and you can get in and explain why you're so excited and why you invested because like you see what the, the founders see, like those things are really consequential very early on. By the time it's a B or a C round, there's very different things that you can help with. And, and again, my personal angel investing strategy is as much about filling it, probably more so about filling in things that are interesting to me. So I got to like the people, I got to like the challenges. I would love that the company's going to have some positive impact in the world. Like it's not just, do I think this thing is going to make money? And so by the time I'm getting through all of those very early helps check a lot of those boxes. Um, but it also is, I think, a fun challenge to then start saying, how do you work your networks? Because that's where you get the most advantage early stage. Later, I can do model. I can do financial modeling. I can look at sales projections and churn and re customer retention. And, and But early on, it's A, understanding the people, like uh, Elizabeth was saying, and then B, even little signals. Like, for example, when somebody reaches out and says, I see we have 50 people in common on LinkedIn, so I thought I'd write because it looks like, you know, maybe you'd be a good fit. I'm like why didn't you come through any of those people? Like it, like there's things that you wouldn't hold against anybody else, but like, are you going to do that when you're making a sales call? Are you going to do that when you're like, so, so little signals about where things are. I like having that as part of the challenge. Um, and then the, the last thing about follow ons, I think I'm a little um, contrary in this way. My, my shorthand rule of thumb, and there's always exceptions is I think that when you're in a venture firm, getting your pro rata, doubling down on your winners is a great story. You can always come up with exceptions, but that's kind of bizarre. I would argue for the typical angel, it's the opposite. And here's why I argue it is because um, when I was in venture, uh, we were time constrained, but not dollar constrained if we were doing well and doing our jobs, right? Um, but when I'm an angel, um, I'm dollar constrained, but not time constrained. So I, I, because I'm not taking on boards, I don't have the fiduciary responsibility. I'm not working with my LPs. I'm just doing my own thing. And so I can have 50 companies. Um, and so, so one of the interesting things is where to put my money. I've had companies that were one notch above not working. Like they were working, they were kind of in that gray area where it's not taking off, but it's not failing, their cash flow break even, but they're on to something that's interesting. Like if it were just in a different environment or something else, they've been acquired and I get a four or five X my money. It was one step above an aqua hire. But if you're so early that that's the only time they raise money, there's a talented team. And so, so when I look at it, I go, well, that can be a four or five X. If a company is now raising at a 75 million valuation, do I really believe that it's just as easy for that one to become a $300 million company, right? And so I have done some pro rata, but my, my default of probably about half a dozen times. And again, at this point, I think in the last eight years, my portfolio is just shy of 100 companies now. Um, but but my, my starting point is I don't do it unless there's an, an exceptional reason why to. Yeah. Um, and something that's, I think, mean, uh, as we've built too, but taking a position in some of uh, those funds as an, a personal LP too, can start to show you great deals, get you get into the motion. And you can also start directly investing in those companies. Um, I like the approach of being able to take an, an indexed model as well. Um, uh, and be able to uh, directly invest, write your own personal checks, but then really get you know more lay of the land um, at some of the other stages as well when you fund invest. I think both of you guys have some of the largest angel portfolios I've ever seen. <laughs> We have a couple questions in the chat and a few of them are, are really solid questions. One of them is around how you recommend angels look at investing in a syndicate versus a fund versus directly in a company. I, I mean, my shorthand would be, um, I think of, 
from the continuum of most financially motivated versus exposure to the real things, like kind of scratching the same itch that being around operators and entrepreneurs give you, um, I think it goes fund, syndicate, and direct. The problem with direct is that I think it's been shown over and over. You have to have a certain size portfolio. You have to be able to get a certain amount of risk into your portfolio and you have to be able to access the networks, right? Like, and so, you know, if you are drawn to that, but you don't know how to choose people or you aren't coming from the circles that you want to be investing in the syndicate, if you know somebody or you see somebody that you would like to be able to follow in on, it's kind of a nice way. I think of it as a hybrid between the two. Um, and then, of course, the funds give you a really interesting purview. A lot of them let you co-invest if you can bring strategic value. They say a couple angels here, you know, we've got a little carved out on the side. And so I think they're all interesting. It's more about what what's your primary motivation for going in on these kind of deals. But the thing that pains me is when I see friends saying they want to angel invest and they, they do like two or three deals, the direct investment deals, because it's just so you can pick the best entrepreneur with the coolest idea. And it doesn't mean that you're you're going to hit the jackpot by having done two deals. Yeah. And one thing. Uh, one thing to add, because I'm sure many people are operating still in angel investing in a, a combo, but play up that operating experience and the background that you can bring to these opportunities, too because I still draw on experiences that I had from operating that you forget um, how valuable they are when, when you can apply those to other people and other networks as well. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, Elizabeth, you know, it's funny you raised that um, back in the late nineties, I was at my first startup in the web 1.0 era doing one of the, the big web based email companies. And we were like three days from filing for IPO when we got acquired and it was in the middle of everything. But during that time period, I was on 20 advisory boards because I didn't have the means to invest even. I only invested in one startup. Um, again, I broke the rule back then, but um, I'd only angel invested in one. But I gave my time to a lot because of the operating experience. And so even as you're angel investing, I think that early stage um, advice that, that they can get is really, really helpful. So I have a fun question, and this is one I actually love to hear stories about. What is the most kind of out there investment you made or something that's not your domain expertise, but you were just really intrigued by the founders of the idea? And how did you get comfort with that that area if, if you've made one? Um, this, is, this is a tricky question. I'm sure I'm going to have a brilliant idea after, after the, after the uh, show. But uh, one that I, or I have two that come to mind. One's earlier and and then one has proven to be really good too, but it seemed crazy at the time. Um, the front desk check-in uh, service that you all probably use called Envoy. Um, Larry Gouda was an engineer at Twitter and really a quirky guy, not the per the type of person you think would uh, would really tackle, you know, a big company be CEO and he's turned out to to really do a, a build a great company. But what I loved hearing there uh, was the problem that made him come up with the idea. And basically he, he finally quit his big job. He was going around visiting all of these friends at their startup company is back when you could have free lunch there and come for meetings. And that's how he's spending his time. And he realized that the front desk check-in was just a pain. And so seeing that change over time, um, it was an idea that very early on I glommed on to and I, I, I love things like this. Um, but so that's um, one that turned out to be really well. And then my who knows, but it's really wacky. A company called Super Plastic. And it's essentially uh, this amazing founder who has created these uh, essentially personas that are on on social channels that are all virtual. So if you they there are these these personalities that people people follow um, and characters and they're really just just you know made up. But how um, how crazy and out there it was and we did invest in that and that has proven to be be really successful so far. Uh, but it's still early but kind of crazy. Well, I think it still is because it's just something probably outside of your DNA. So how did you get up to speed? Did you leverage other people? What gave you the comfort at the end of the day to write the check? 
Uh, well, I was going to say I'm kind of boring. I mean, I, I do a lot. I, I Coming out of running strategy for LinkedIn, I kind of had a market map in my head of where I thought the world would evolve in terms of software productivity, uh, productivity tools with a social bent to them. Um, so I did a lot of those. Then it started being just my network, like where are people taking me? So it's not so much that it's a crazy, wacky idea, but it's more like you'd never expect to find me around it. Um, for example, I just one of my most recent investments is um, is uh, cancer detection, early cancer detection company. And it's just, you know, I, I've been digging in. I've been having to figure out what's going on in the category, um, which is fascinating. I like having to get up to speed fast. And then the things I know that I can bring to them, they're getting the benefit. So it's kind of coming from from opposite ends. But that's not that's not so much the wacky stuff. It's hard for me to do really wacky when it's my own money and I'm saying I want to spend time with it. Um, so yeah, that's not that that's that not that exciting. Well, we only have a couple more minutes, but one area I'd love to dig into is how you see your role post investment. So what are the areas that you try to support and add value and continue to help with the founders? And when do you kind of start to peel off? Yeah. Um, for me, uh, one is connecting them any way I can, prospective customers, giving them market intelligence if I see other stuff, helping them recruit talent. Um, if it's in a domain I know, helping sometimes just go sit down and do strategy or brainstorm or be a sounding board, even if I'm just a piece to the conversation. Um, I, I Sometimes I'll coach on how to get your investors and friends of the firm helpful, like with the updates that people send out. I'll actually spend time helping them think about like effective templates that get people to do more for you. Um, and then uh, and then as and, and obviously getting more investors later on. So introductions of that sort. I typically kind of fade back into the background when it gets to be much more operationalized, where, you know, you're you're building out, um, you know, you're, you're going from the five to 10 salespeople. Now you're working on like, what do I do and how do I comp 100 salespeople like those? Those kind of problems are beyond the stage that I'm typically helping. That doesn't mean I'm gone completely. Like I still have it where now some of the companies I invested seven, eight years ago will write and say that they are talking to a CMO candidate and it's somebody that I worked with years ago or that they see I'm connected to. Can I help them diligence it without it showing that it's them? And so like there's they pop up, but the frequency goes way down. And then the last one, I guess, is evangelizing. Um, when I'm not angel investing, I'm spending time out with some big companies, big organizations. And so using my portfolio as examples of what I think is coming in the world and what I think is interesting and promising actually does parlay into interesting deals for the companies. And so I use them as my examples to evangelize them as much as I can. Uh, and I have found that I'm leaned on for a variety of things, but really stick, try to stick to what you know. Don't try to be be everything uh, to these companies. But um, and I've been able to pop in throughout different stages of companies as well. But one uh, is recruiting and hiring and connecting using your network to really un unshape great talent for them. Uh, hire you know is is such a key thing um, for me personally. Uh, the motion I mentioned of connecting the Fortune 500 to uh, to companies with the end goal being business development and revenue as uh, some of not just customer potential customer interest, but how do you ready a startup to speak to people like that? When should you take money uh, from from early customers or are they going to make you pivot, et cetera? Uh, and then I often am spending time a lot of time on two more areas and one is is in introducing to the stage usters that whatever stage they're at and tailoring it um, to what great partner at that firm would be good for this and really spending a lot of time thinking around construction on when how do you many angels do you bring in when do you take an institutional check etc so i spend a lot of time on that and uh, lastly for me, I spend a lot of uh, cycles on just life, like EQ with founder, when they call and they're stressed about something and how do you just talk through things? And I often put my AirPods on now and go out for walks. Um, and I love those types of conversations because you really can build a real and a, a great one with, with them as well. So those are big areas for me. 
I love those. I totally agree. There's the you know emotional side of building that relationship and being that sounding board and that you know person who can hang in there with them. And then there's the practical applications of helping build the company. And I've personally found where I can be most effective is a quick triage to somebody who's an expert. So get out of the way and just try to you know make sure that I can connect them to the right people. Awesome. Thank you guys both. That was a very quick 30 minutes. I think I could talk to you guys forever, but appreciate the time. You guys are a wealth of knowledge. And with that, we are going to break into the breakout sessions.